So thanks so much again for coming. My name is Sarah Boleen. I'm the events coordinator here on behalf of the entire staff. I'm so pleased to welcome you. And I'm so pleased to welcome Peter Blair Henry tonight. Peter is the Dean of the Stern School of Business at NYU. And in his book, Turnaround, Third World Lessons for the First World Growth, he argues that the secret to emerging country success and our own is discipline, sustained commitment to a pragmatic growth strategy. Through examples ranging from the drastic income disparity between Barbados and Jamaica to the catch-up econ economics of China and the taming of inflation in Latin America, Peter shows that in much of the emerging world, the policy pendulum now swings towards prudence and self-control. Michael Spence, who is the 2001 Nobel laureate in economics, says about the book, Turnaround is essential reading for anyone willing to be convinced that learning should be a two-way street between advanced and developing economies. Again, I'm so pleased that you're here. Please join me in welcoming Peter Blair Henry to Politics and Press. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> it's a Thursday evening and you've come out to hear a talk about a book on economic policy, so you've got great courage. Uh, this book is as much about humanity and relationships as it is about economic policy. And what I'd like to do with uh, my re remaining time uh, before we open up for question and answer period is just give you a sense of what are really some critical issues. What a really critical moment in the world economy. Uh, growth uh, is slow in the advanced economies. Uh, it was 1.3 percent last year. Uh, Europe is in recession, and emerging economies are, the first, are for the first time driving an economic recovery. And the question is, how will we create a more prosperous future for all of us? And really, in a nutshell, the book is about the three things that can allow us all to have a more prosperous future. And what we in the first world can learn from the history of the developing world to help us attain that more prosperous future. And so what are those three things? Those three things are discipline, clarity, and trust. And so what I'd like to do is just give you some stories if I may, from the book, just to illustrate uh, the power of those, uh, those three nouns. So discipline. Discipline isn't what you think it means in the context of economic policy. Discipline, discipline doesn't mean fiscal austerity, nor does it mean wasteful spending. To put it in terms of eating habits, discipline isn't crash dieting or binge eating, or sugary sodas if you're from New York like I am. <laughs> discipline is about finding that middle path to prosperity. So discipline means a sustained commitment to long-term prosperity that's both vigilant and flexible, and very importantly, puts what's good for the country as a whole over what's good for any, any individual, interest group, or person running for political office. And in the context of fiscal policy, which I think is appropriate uh, to, to talk about, given the current uh, discussions around the world, both in the United States and in Europe, about fiscal policy, this one is no more complicated than a simple story that everyone, everyone already knows, the story of the ant and the grasshopper and Aesop's fable. The ant saved when times were flush so that it had something to eat when times were hard. The grasshopper partied during flush times and was really hungry when times were lean. Who's the ant and who's the grasshopper? At one point in time, the first world went around uh, the third world lecturing about how to be more ant-like. But in 2001, in this country, we had a record $236 billion fiscal surplus, which we decided, again, during flush times, well, we would return this to the people, quote unquote, tax cuts. During 2002 to 2007, during a record period of global growth, not just the United States, but all advanced nations, 
ran fiscal deficits, about 3% of GDP, became more indebted. Formerly third world countries, who by the way have used discipline to turn themselves around and become emerging markets, ran fiscal surpluses during that period. A country in particular, a story that really resonates, is the story of Chile. Chile in 2008, again coming out of this record period of global growth from 2002 to 2007, experienced a boom due to uh, the run-up in commodity prices, copper in particular in Chile. There was enormous pressure on the Chilean finance minister, Andres Velasco, to spend that surplus, to give it back to the people. Mr. Velasco resisted that pressure. He was burned in effigy in the streets but said, no, this money is for a rainy day. He didn't use those exact words, but that's the essence of what he said. And of course, you know the rest of the story, we had a financial crisis. In the depths of the financial crisis, Chile had socked away billions of dollars that allowed it to then implement a $4 billion tax cut to stimulate the economy, to provide a buffer, exactly as we learned in Economics 101. That's called counter-cyclical fiscal policy. No more complicated than the story of the ant and the grasshopper. Third world ants, first world grasshoppers. That's discipline. Clarity. For clarity, I want to tell you the story of uh, another Caribbean island. Not Jamaica, but the, the tiny island of Barbados. In 1992, Barbados faced uh, an enormous financial uh, crisis, a potential financial crisis. They were about to run out of foreign exchange reserves. Uh, the U.S. Was, economy was in a recession, and as an economy heavily dependent on, on, on U.S. tourism and, uh, and the exports uh, they have to the rest of the world, Barbados was in real trouble. And Barbados, uh, received a visit from the International Monetary Fund, also known as the IMF. Uh, Barbados, uh, at that point in time, also had uh, what's called a fixed exchange rate, much like the countries in the Eurozone have a fixed exchange rate. The exchange rate was pegged at a, at a certain value, in this case 1.7 Barbadian dollars to the U.S. dollar. The IMF said, your country has become very uncompetitive in the same way that Countries in much of Europe today have become uncompetitive. Wages had risen very quickly, much faster than productivity. Costs had risen. What to do? The IMF said, well, we think you should devalue your currency. Devaluing your currency will make your exports cheaper. It will make imports more expensive. That will allow your economy to readjust. It will make you more competitive. The Barbadian leadership said, we don't think so. We don't like the idea of cutting wages without the people's consent, which in fact is what a devaluation is. Because if you move from 1.7 Barbadian dollars, for instance, to 2 US dollars, that's essentially cutting people's wages without their consent. And the Prime Minister Erskine Sandiford said, we're going to convene a discussion. We're going to bring together the private sector, the unions, and the government, and we're going to talk about this problem. And over the course of the next several months, there was a very heated discussion. The alternatives were laid out. The Barbadian leadership said, we have a choice. We could either do what the IMF says, which is to value the currency, which very few of us want to do, or we can cut wages but we have to do something. Ultimately, the discussions uh, got to a very difficult place. Uh, the government consulted with the private sector and the unions, and it was agreed that there would be a 9% wage cut. A 9% wage cut. People were very unhappy. They took to the streets. Roughly uh, 30,000 people took to the streets. In Barbados, it's roughly an eighth of the population. 
So that's the equivalent of roughly 40 million people marching on Washington to protest wage cuts. Somehow, the center held. The leader of the trade unions, to his everlasting credit, said, we have to do this to save the country. The three parties came together, the wage cut held, and Barbados' economy actually recovered quite quickly. For his efforts, the prime minister and his party were kicked out of power for 14 years. <laughs> the economy recovered after they were summarily dismissed from office. And when asked in retrospect, would he do it again? Prime Minister Staniford, or former Prime Minister Staniford said, the price I paid was a small price to save the country. Clarity. Clarity matters. People often ask me, well, Barbados is so small. What can Europe possibly take from Barbados? And my answer to that is, it's not so easy to do things in a small country. In a small country, the person whose wages get cut is not anonymous. A cut in wages affects your brother, your cousin, possibly even your mother or your father. So if a tiny country, a close-knit society, can find a way to make difficult decisions, to find a way to make its economy more competitive, not through austerity, but through reform. And by the way, the part of the story that I left out, the, the private sector agreed to open its books to the unions and agreed that in the future there would be wage increases in line with productivity increases. In other words, the benefits of future productivity would be shared amongst workers and the companies. A social compact, compromise, clarity about what needed to be done. The third key lesson from emerging economies about what needs to happen in order for us to have a more prosperous future relates to this issue of trust. So discipline, clarity, trust. I mentioned the IMF. And let's go now from Chile and Barbados to emerging economies as a larger group. And let's talk about the so-called BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the large emerging economies. The, the BRICS, the so-called BRICS, now account for 21% of global output. And yet, at the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, two of the world's most august economic and financial in institutions for setting the international policy agenda that together with the United States Treasury played a major role in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s in teaching, again, former third world countries what they needed to do to turn around their economies and become emerging markets. At these institutions, the BRICS only have 11.5% of the voting shares despite their 21% contribution to the global economy. In contrast, the countries of the Eurozone area account for about 25% of global GDP and have 32% of the votes. Why is that a trust issue? Well, in order for emerging economies to continue to grow, to continue to be that engine of growth that's pulling us in the United States, Western Europe, and Japan, out of the economic doldrums, we need the BRICS and other large emerging economies to continue down that disciplined path that's allowed them to turn themselves around. But will they do so? Will they continue to do so? Will their political leaders have the capital they need to sell tough, clear decisions to their electorates if there's no reciprocation at the world's major institutions? I'll give you another example. At the onset of the financial crisis, uh, the advanced countries, all countries, but the advanced countries in particular, made a pledge to be committed to continuing free trade. 
open markets. And yet, between November 2008 and November 2010, we know that there were more than 800 instances of protectionist measures implemented during that time. More than 40 percent of those uh, were implemented by G former G7 countries. So as much talk as there is right now about fiscal deficits, when we look at the world economy, it seems to me that the trust deficit is perhaps our largest impediment to future growth. We need to build trust. And the unwillingness of first world countries, again, to reciprocate, to recognize the new stature, uh, the gains that the former third world has made by taking the long road uh, to prosperity undermines our chances for a shared future of prosperity. So the last thing I'd like to say <clears throat> before opening up to questions is something quite extraordinary happened yesterday. And it's hard for me to say this because I'm actually, you know, as I alluded to in the reading, I'm Anglican. <laughs> I'm Episcopalian, so, I'm, so we, you know, we, we broke from the Catholic Church a long time ago. <laughs> But the Catholic Church, uh, you know, so I guess as, you know, as Episcopalians and Anglicans were saying, it's about time that they sort of caught up on the reform end. <laughs> Big change yesterday. First third world pope. One of the world's most, arguably most conservative institutions has found the humility to recognize the future. That the future lies largely in the case of the Catholic Church in the emerging world. But uh, as it goes in, in the Catholic Church, so too in economics. Will the first world be able to summon the discipline, the clarity, and let me just add the humility to regain or gain the trust of the emerging world so that we can all share a more prosperous future? I'm hopeful. Be happy to answer any questions that you have. I guess there's two parts to your your uh, presentation. One, what are the lessons? But second, is this country in a position or has any interest in actually learning? Mm. And I think if the United States was really interested in lessons from abroad, it would be on the metric system and wouldn't have the dis <laughs> wouldn't have the d grotesque uh, health system that it has. Um, what would be an example of a lesson that the United States has already learned that you, would make you hopeful that more would follow in the future? I think we're still gathering our data. <laughs> so I'm normally, an, you know, I'm normally an empirical economist, um, but sometimes uh, you do have to go on the on, on the on the substance of things hoped for. Evidence, evidence of things not seen, as 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 Paul Paul tells us. Um. I guess I have a small question and then a larger one. I think I heard bits of you speaking. Uh, I mean, um, I heard the bits. You you were on the radio this this morning, uh, whether it was Kojo. Or yeah, it was on Kojo's yeah. show. Because uh, I don't know somebody, whether it was you saying that uh, the United States uh, development programs didn't do anything in the area of economic growth. Uh, was that one of the things you said? Yes. Yeah. Well, as someone who, uh, after doing other things, worked for USAID Qualified, yes. in the Qualified, economic yes. growth area for about 15 years, uh, I can see a bit what you meant and that we work more on developing the, uh, the underpinnings for economic growth, like uh, legal, uh, legal systems that are uh, uh, 
and the private economy, that sort of thing. But uh, <laughs> I would talk about to you about that at some other time. But my question, my bigger question mm -hmm. is, because you're an economist and I'm a sort of an eclectic, uh, <laughs> focusing on economics, is that we have um, certain principles that we've instilled in development, and I have, and they come out of economics, and I've developed some questions about them because every situation is quite complex. Uh, privatization is one of them. Mm -hmm. Economy is where the state runs everything, certainly don't work, but selling off your water system doesn't always work either. And my main question is about what you've been, uh, as another example, is free trade, mm -hmm. because that is something we push very strongly. And as you say, we <laughs> violate it in certain ways, but I'm also not convinced that it is the best thing for developing economies. I think it's it's a real muddle that I genuinely would like your opinion because when this country was getting its start, we relied on developing infant industries and protection. And uh, very often, uh, free trade serves our economy more than it serves some of these other economies. So. Anyway, I wonder what the balance is and whether economics always uh, serves well. Yeah. So uh, specifically on the free on the free trade question, uh, you know, there I will go from hope to fact. <laughs> um, so I think the fa I think the, the facts uh, speak pretty clearly uh, about this. So one, again, one of the the, the 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 points I try to emphasize in the book is this is not an that's not an ideological discussion. It's I try to emphasize pragmatism. And so what we know is that on, on average, countries, when countries open up to free trade, they tend to grow faster. And they tend to grow faster for the, for, for the reasons that I, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. It allows them to use their resources more efficiently. It allows them to focus on what they do best. And for every t example of a country uh, where a country successfully protected, uh, I'm going to make this number up, but it's to for the first approximation certainly right. Uh, there are at least 10 examples of that not working. And so uh, given the, the wealth of history as to uh, how countries have prospered as a result of opening up to, free, up to free trade, I think the presumption has to be very strong th uh, that um, The notion that the government uh, or any particular industry has specialized uh, knowledge th that will allow it in isolation uh, to do something particularly special and, and, and good for the country as a whole, um, it's pretty hard, to make the, pretty hard to make that argument. But there can be exceptions. Uh, you speak of uh, discipline, clarity, and truth. Do you see any a sign of that in this administration or trust, in the, trust. this Congress? <laughs> Secondly, I see you served in President Obama's, uh, not his inauguration, his uh, transition. Team. His transition, right. Uh, I also have a hard time believing President Obama agrees with anything that you've said this evening. He's not for, in, particularly interested in growth, he's interested in redistribution. Well, I'm speaking on my behalf this evening on no one else's, and I haven't discussed my book with the president. <laughs> um, I think that we all want uh, the same things. I think that there's deep disagreement at the moment about how we get there. And I think part of the reason why there's so much disagreement right now is that I think the discussion has really kind of coalesced around ideological points as opposed to principles. Right? So one of the best ways to bring about a fair society, as I read earlier, is to bring about more growth. Right? And uh, while there can be many paths for achieving higher growth, and that's one of the points of the book, there's no one simple way to do it. Uh, the three key principles that I mentioned are what have to underpin 
any strategy. So in business terms, right, uh, the pragmatic growth strategy is the vision. That's sort of the mission. But the execution requires some flexibility, right, because opportunities arise and you have to be tactical. And the question right now is whether we'll be smart enough, tactical enough to find the common ground we need to find uh, to get some uh, policies through that are actually going to move us forward. Uh, good evening. Uh, quick question with regards to education. As the dean of the NYU Stern School of Business, uh, there... I do speak for him tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see, you know, from that school that there are a lot of international students mm -hmm. coming to the school. So from your personal experience, uh, obviously we're doing something right by attracting all these foreign students that then go back to their land and, I guess, implement the things that we've taught them. Are we doing the right thing? Why are they coming? And why are we not going to North Korea to study or whatever? <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question. So I, I would say, so one of, the, one of the great things, there are many great things about the United States, but one of the things that we do particularly well is higher education. And we know that because people want to, people want to study here. Right. So uh, that's one of the, one of the, one of the, one of the reasons that, that I am quite optimistic. I mean, we, you know, at the Stern School, we talk about um, the challenges facing the world as opportunities to create value for society. That's why you ought to go to business school, to learn how to turn challenges and opportunities to create value. And, and it doesn't matter where you come from. Uh, one of the great uh, benefits to the United States uh, is that we have this wonderful system. And people come in, they sometimes go home, but oftentimes they stay for a while. And they invent things, start new companies, teach our students. So that's a, it's a great example of, I think, one of the reasons why we can be very hopeful about our future. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. I was um, wondering if you'd comment on the th thought that developed countries and United States and Europe and so forth, Japan, are now um, in a position where they're going to have lower growth on average than you know, developing or emerging economies because of aging of population, increased energy costs, other factors as well, and whether you see that as a sort of a permanent feature of the world economy where the, the, the developed countries are just going to be growing more slowly and that the emerging economies are going to take an increasing share of uh, world production, et cetera? That's a great question. So uh, the short answer is uh, for um, fundamental reasons re related to the fact that emerging economies are still catching up. This, this process of turnaround, they're, 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 they've made these reforms. Um, they will continue to grow more quickly than, uh, than advanced nations f uh, for some time if we're lucky, by the way, um, uh, and if they continue down the, down the right path. But the great news is that we can all win. So faster growth in the emerging world uh, is good for us because as the, the middle class emerges uh, in Mexico, Brazil, Asia, and hopefully Africa as well, those consumers will buy more of our goods. Those citizens, as their incomes rise, will be able to come to the United States coming to politics and pros <laughs> on their vacation. They will, they will consume our services. So, there, so there's a win-win. There's uh, the, so the issue is, um, the worry is not that emerging economies will continue to grow faster than advanced countries. It's whether advanced countries will grow at their potential. And right now we're underachieving. And that's the key thing that we need. So we need discipline, clarity, and trust to get back on track. Thank you. Thank you. Empty mic needs to be filled, right? Um, I'm very interested in what you say about trust, and like another speaker, it would be nice to see more of it on our own shores. But I wonder if you talk in the book at all about the opposite of trust, which I see as corruption. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are many of the developing, the would-be developing countries that could develop way faster if there were less corruption. No question that you're right. And I think it's important to be clear. When I say that there are important lessons, third world lessons for first world growth, 
I by no means imply that the third world has learned all of its lessons. One of the things I talked about in the last chapters, uh, chapter of the book is that there's still much work to be done. And it's precisely because there's much work to be done on issues like corruption, further, uh, further reforms in other areas, that we build this trust. Because in order uh, for uh, the emerging world to want to continue down this path, um, they need to feel as though uh, there's something in it for them. Uh, so, trust is critical. Uh, corruption is an, is an important issue um, in a lot of societies. Uh, but I think that um, uh, better relations uh, between the emerging world and the developed world can also help on that, uh, on that as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much again for coming. Thank you to Peter Buller Henry. I'm sure if you have more questions.